Hello, my name is Mary Jo New. I'm going to be reading Romans 6, verses 1, verses 1 to 14 from the English Standard Version. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin live, live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been unified with him a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments to unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as is instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under the grace. Amen. Pray with me this morning as we open God's word. Our God and Father, our creator, you have been good and gracious to us. Your mercy has been rich, your grace and your goodness have been abounding, and we have the joy and the privilege to have your word open before us, to be read for us to hear, and now, God, to be preached, for us to submit humbly before, but to receive with joy. We just ask for the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give us ready hearts, a readiness to accept your truth as that, as truth. Give us ready hearts. Give us ready and willing hearts and minds and wills to submit to these truths. Father, fill us with your spirit and give us the strength not just to hear them this morning, but to be able to walk into obedience. For that is this path of joy that you've laid before us. You have not set your people in place ignorant of you, but you have made yourself known. And so we take joy in being able to open up your word to hear you. And may there be nothing on my part that is said that would distract from that or contradict with the truth of your word. But Father, use me for your glory. I give myself to you. I give this congregation to you, this time to you, all that you have determined to accomplish. Please bring about for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that you have come to appreciate and treasure our study in Romans, and in particular, really, Romans chapter 6. Uh, we are, we've slowed down a little bit. We took two Sundays to look at chapter 5, and here we are on our third Sunday looking at chapter 6, and we still haven't finished it, uh, because it is taking on quite a significance in Romans in Paul's letter. And so I, I trust that you have found Romans 6 to be a treasure and a source of joy and encouragement for you. Really what we find Paul doing, and I could just simply begin this morning by asking us a question. If you were to be asked the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be saved? You know, how would you answer that question? Perhaps somebody has asked you that over these last couple of weeks. And so you're a Christian, like what does that mean? 
there are some simple ways that we could ask that or answer that. Just, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I obey his teachings. I agree with his teachings and I obey his teachings and I've trusted him to be my savior. You could say, well, I, I'm sa I guess it means that I'm saved. I'm saved from eternity and separation from God. I'm saved from an eternity in hell. And I'm saved and will spend eternity with God in heaven. That's what it means to be a Christian. Perhaps you'll think back to our study in chapter 3 and you will say, well, to be a Christian means that I've been forgiven of my sins. I was held captive and I had a penalty on my life because I was a sinner, but because of Jesus, my sins are forgiven. And God has justified me. He's declared me to be righteous and I can spend eternity with him. And all of those would be right and good answers. And I hope that you use them. I hope you respond to that way. But what we're reading here in Romans chapter 6, which kind of flows from what he introduced in chapter 5, specifically the second half of chapter 5, Paul is really getting to the heart of that question, the answer to that question. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be saved? And at the heart of Paul's gospel, this gospel that he is unashamed of, what it means to be a Christian means that you are united with Christ. You are one with Christ. You're unified. You've been united to him so that all that is his is yours. His righteousness, his future, his rule, his kingship is mine. And this idea of union with Christ Paul began to explain that at the end of chapter 5. He talks about the first Adam and the second Adam. And being in the first Adam, we're made sinners, we're condemned. But when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're put in the second Adam. We're baptized, as he would at the beginning of this chapter, baptized into Christ. We're unified with him. We're one with him. So we are made righteous. Yes, we have forgiveness. His death is our death. He would go on to say that his burial is our burial and his resurrection is our resurrection. And Paul would say to be a Christian means that we are united to Jesus Christ so that all of those are, are ours. And when God the Father looks down and sees a Christian, someone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. The Father sees Jesus. Doesn't look at Steve and say, well, Steve's guilty, Jesus is innocent, he's righteous. No, he sees G, Steve Strong, and he sees the righteousness of Jesus. And the resurrection of Jesus is ours. And he says, if these things are true, and they are, consequently, we have been freed from sin. Sin no longer reigns in our lives. We have been freed from sin's penalty. We have been freed from sin's rule and mastery and dominion on our lives. And we will one day be freed from sin's presence. To be a Christian is to be united to Jesus Christ and to be freed from sin. And our union with Jesus Christ has brought a spiritual life and vitality. He would describe this life and vitality at the end of verse 11 of chapter 6 considering ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. What does it mean to be dead to sin and alive to God? Well, when we think of anything as having died, there's no life. But specifically think perhaps that there's, there's no response to the life around them. 
there is no reaction, there is no interaction, there is no interest, there is no recognition. An animal that is walking on the edge of the Grand Canyon is dead to the beauty of the Grand Canyon. Because there's no response, there's no interaction, there's no awareness of it. And to be dead to sin, the mastery and dominion of sin has been broken, and there is now to be no response to sin, no interaction with sin. We recognize it, and we're dead to it. And we said we are alive to God. And so that life that is breathed into us, we recognize, we respond, and we interact, and we have an awareness of who God is and His glory. As God's people, you recognize this. Perhaps you think about the time when, when you came to know Jesus Christ and you were awakened to the beauty of the gospel. Maybe the week or months before, you would come into a worship service and you would hear the songs or you would hear the scriptures read and there was a, a deadness to it, but you came to Christ. You were made alive. And those senses and those desires and the taste for God and for His Word were awakened. And there was a recognition and a desire and a longing for God and His Word and gathering. And now I want to take part in the singing of His praises. Being dead to sin and alive to God. You see, before Jesus Christ, before salvation, the opposite is true. We're dead to God. There is not a recognition, there is not an awareness, there is not a response to the glory of God, there is not an interaction with God, there is not a recognition, yet there is all of those to sin. And to be a Christian means that we are dead to sin and alive to God. This is the definition of a Christian. And that's why Paul would finish verse 11 and he say, with the very first imperative, all of these things are true. Are we united to Jesus Christ? His death, burial, and resurrection is ours. He has died to sin. Sin no longer reigns and has dominion. That is true of me. And that's why the first imperative in the book of Romans we, we introduced and we looked at last week, and it begins with our own mindset. Chapters 5 and here in 6, this is me. This defines me. This is the truth of who I am. I am dead to sin and alive to God. And the very first imperative, the very first command is we have to think this way about ourselves. I have to think this about me. And that's the starting point. Too often we don't think of ourselves this way. These spiritual realities, being dead to sin and alive to God, define who I am. There are a lot of things in our lives that try to define us. Paul is really just kind of zeroing in and saying, this defines you. This defines you. How do I see myself? Therefore, we must consider ourselves dead to sin, and alive to God. And it, it, it's no wonder that Paul would begin, as he begins to take some of these spiritual truths and realities and begin to kind of prod us into obedience, he begins with our thinking. We, we, I need to just stop and I need to think this way about myself because actions always flow out of thinking. Our actions will always flow out of what is dominating my heart and my mind. I'm always acting consistent with how I am thinking. And so we've come here to verse 12 to 14. And he says, we have to be thinking about ourselves this way because out of this type of mindset about myself, he then introduces the second imperative, the second command. The third is down in verse 19, and we'll touch on that in three weeks. But for us this morning, we 
now are addressing this third imperative, this third command. And it's really kind of packaged as three. So you'll see here in my notes here in a second, the imperative 2A, 2B, and 2C. Because they all work together as one. But if there's a big idea for us this morning in thinking about this, in a review from last week, believers must think of themselves as dead to sin and alive to God. Then here as we begin in verse 12, believers must live their lives as dead to sin and alive to God. Believers not just think of ourselves, live our lives as dead to sin and alive to God. And we will struggle in this and fail in this if our mindset is not established as being and seeing myself as dead to sin and alive to God. So we must live our lives as dead to sin and alive to God. Let me read verses 12 through 14. We'll begin looking at this second imperative and where Paul directs our attention. He says in verse 12, Let sin, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but rather present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For because sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. Let's see this first imperative, imperative 2a. Let not sin reign, or let sin not reign. At first glance and first reading, this imperative maybe seems like it's directed toward you and I. Like, Steve, don't let sin reign. But this is not really a directive toward us as individuals. Sin is really the, the subject of this verb, of this phrase. And Paul is almost making a statement, kind of in a similar way that Jesus prayed or, or taught his disciples to pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, let the kingdom come. Let your will be done. It is almost a, a prayer. It's almost a statement that it is a directive toward us as individuals. Because Paul is not pulling Steve Strong aside and saying, Steve, don't let sin reign. He touches, he'll go in that direction. But right here, he was just making this proclamation. Sin cannot reign, will not reign. Sin must not reign. Sin must not take the throne, reigning in the sense of being a king, exercising its authority, its influence, its, its power. Almost as if to say, let this be the truth and the reality. But sin does not reign. In God's people. And I think it's important to note by phrasing it this way that the sin in, in our lives, in your life and in my life, has the potential to be king. We have not yet been freed from the presence of sin, we still struggle with sin. And the sin in us continues to reach for the throne that it has been pushed off of. Your sin wants to rule your life, wants to master you. Your sin wants to get back and exercise its kingship. Jesus Christ has set us free from sin, but our sin is not just going away easily. It wants back that authority and that influence.
And what does it want as king? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, in your physical body, the way that you exist right now. Let not sin reign in you right now to cause you or to make you to obey its passions, its desires. Every king has an objective. We see that throughout the Old Testament, perhaps in your own scripture reading, in your plan, you're reading about some of the kings, and the kings have objectives, and most often those objectives are met not by the king, but by his people. My, my first thought went back to after King Solomon died and his son took the throne, Rehoboam. And the people were coming to him and say, listen, we will follow you, but if you could just lighten the load. Of course, Rehoboam follows that foolish wisdom of his young buddies. And he just magnifies his load that he presses down on his people. Nebuchadnezzar was another king that my thoughts were drawn to in thinking about kingship. Now, Nebuchadnezzar built that monument to his glory and gathered all of his people, and he told them, bow down, or I will kill you. Kings have objectives. This week I even read about a butterfly. We all like butterflies, right? It's summer. Well, there are some nefarious butterflies out there. There's one in England, and I think in Europe, I think it's just simply called the large blue butterfly. Maybe you've heard about this. Well, in its caterpillar stage, uh, it's not an herbivore. I think it would be considered an omnivore. Well, this caterpillar will crawl to an open area and secrete a nice, sweet substance off its back, and it will gather a very specific species of ant. And that ant will be drawn to it, and when the ants kind of come around this caterpillar, this caterpillar breathes in or does something air, it puffs itself up, and it puts off even more scent, and it begins to act in a certain way that it fools these ants, causing them to think that this is their queen. And what the ant will do, the ants will grab it and take it into their nest, and they will treat it like a queen. And that caterpillar then begins to feed on the larvae there in the nest, taking out that colony. And after a certain period of time, after it cocoons, it comes out, and it's this pretty blue butterfly. Nobody knows what it just got done doing. And I, I was watching this, and I'm like, that's sin. That's the kind of king that sin is. Accept me in, but I only desire to deceive and to devour. Obey my passions. What are the passions of sin? Well, John would write in 1 John, what most of us I'm sure are familiar with, well, sin's passions can be summarized as the pride of life, Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the passions of our sin, and the pride of life says, it's about me. I must be at the center of life. The lust of the eyes, I must have. Possessions are at the center of our life. The lust, of the, the lust of the flesh, I must feel. I must experience. Pleasure is at the center of our lives. I mean, we saw this exhibited as Paul began his letter in Romans chapter 1, exchanging the glory of God. But these are sins passions. And, and, and these three passions, these three desires, the I must be, I must have, I must feel, 
manifests itself in any number of vast and varied ways. In fact, Jesus would talk about a few of those ways. Jesus talking about out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaking. Mark records him saying in chapter 7, verse 21, where he just says, uh, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. He says, all these evil things come from within and defile a person. We could take time and connect each of these actions perhaps to one of those root evil passions and desires. But nonetheless, we could look at our lives and we see, wow, there's coveting, there's slander, there's, there's foolishness and pride, there's envy, deceit, sensuality. And the fruit of that tells us, wow, something is at rule on my heart. These sinful, evil passions. Paul would write to the Galatians. Again, another passage I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Right before he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, he talks about the fruits of the flesh. These desires that are warring with the Spirit. He says the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. But he says it's also idolatry, sorcery, and enmity, and strife, and jealousy, fits of anger, and rivalries, and dissensions, and divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. It's the fruit of sin's passions. Paul would also write to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3 where he says that we need to put to death what is earthly in us. Again, sexual morality and impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. And it's on account of these things that God's wrath is coming. And he says, in these you once walked when you were living in them, when you were dead to God and alive to sin, you lived these things. But now you must put them all away. And with those put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. And don't lie to one another. Seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices. All of these actions are manifestations of the rule of sin in our hearts the kingship of sin, causing us to obey its passions, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. And Paul is telling us sin will not reign. Sin has been taken off of that throne. These things have no place in our lives. We must be free of them. They are not to characterize us. And so he brings us to the second and part of this imperative is, all right, if this is that standard, if this is the truth, that sin will not reign, making us to obey its passions in this mortal body, that's this imperative, that is the reality. All right, now for us, and now this imperative here is he begins to point at us and it's put in a negative way. First of all, don't present your body as an instrument of unrighteousness for sinning. This word presenting is important for us. It's the idea of placing at someone's disposal for their use. In Acts chapter 23, as Paul was being taken from Jerusalem up to Caesarea, they presented him or provide, provided for him a mount so that he could ride on a horse or a donkey. Here's your saddle. It is for you to use. I think it's a powerful illustration 
And Jesus was with, was with his disciples and he's preaching and there's a, a massive crowd there with him. And he recognizes that they're hungry, looks at his disciples and say, feed them. We don't have any, how in the world are we going to, it's this time of day, how are we going to have that much money to feed all these thousands of people? Well, there's a little boy over here with a lunch. We're not told these words, but it's obvious what happened. That little boy, here's my lunch. I present it to you. You use this lunch however you want. Whenever you want to use it. And however you wish. And Paul's saying, don't do that with your life. Don't, don't take your physical body, don't take your actions, your words, your hands, your eyes, your feet, your mouth, and don't say, hey, sin, use however you want. As an instrument, as a tool to sin. And at first reading, we think about that and we think, okay, yeah, that's true, but how often we do the exact opposite. How, how quickly and easily we just take this, this physical existence, this life, our hands, our eyes, our mouth, our brain, our thinking, our ears, and we just present it to sin as an instrument to do what is wrong. How in the world do we do this? We just easily, it seems it's so natural for us, to spend some time just trying to think through, looking at my own life, how, how is it that we present our lives as instruments of righteousness? Like, how can this, how does this happen? Well, I suggest to us, perhaps, first of all, it's because we get spiritually lazy. We live an undisciplined and unevaluated walk with Christ. The disciplines of Time with the Lord and reading in Scripture and in prayer, our own worship. We're undisciplined. And in so doing, by being undisciplined, passively, we just present our lives as an instrument of sin. Not only do we get spiritually lazy, we get spiritually careless. Sin is like the Grand Canyon, and we just walk as close to it as we can. Well, it's not sinning, but I, I, I'll just be careless in getting as close to it as I can. We give, as Paul would write in chapter 13, we give opportunity for our flesh. I may not actually do it, but I, I'll allow myself to get into a position where I will either have easy opportunity or I'll face temptation. Maybe it's people in our lives or devices. Maybe it's music, whatever it is. We get, we get spiritually careless. We also get spiritually inattentive. We're just not focused. Paul would write to the Colossians to say, set your mind on the things that are above. Jesus would say to seek first the kingdom of God. And we just too easily get spiritually inattentive to what is eternal in our lives. We are so distracted by what is temporal and not what is eternal. Relationships become about what is temporal and not what is eternal. Our employment, our finance, everything becomes about what is temporal rather than what is about eternal. We become so spiritually inattentive and we also become spiritually impatient. Wanting right now rather than walking the long course that God has laid out for us. Trusting in His wisdom and in His timing. When the difficulty comes, we're just all about escaping it rather than finding Him as I walk through it. We're spiritually impatient. And then perhaps most importantly, we, also, we become very spiritually impersonal. Not with each other. 
but with Jesus. Joseph didn't know Jesus, but he knew Yahweh. When faced with the temptation brought about by Potiphar's wife, it was, how can I do this sin against God? Paul would write for me to live is Christ and to die is gain because I get Christ. He would write to the Philippians that the, the all-surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. You know, you think about what you would never do because of the effects that it would have on your family. And that's a, that's a fine motivation, but it's a temporary motivation. Do we think about our union with Christ? How can I do this and think this and live this way with Jesus? Become very spiritually impersonal. And Paul is saying, listen, remember who you are. You're dead to sin, alive to God. This is your mindset. And he says, listen, because of this, don't present your physical body as a tool for unrighteousness, but rather do something, and here's to see, which is the opposite. Present your body as an instrument of righteousness. But he doesn't say that first. What does he say? But present yourselves to God. Be like that boy with his lunch every day. Wake up while you're having breakfast. Pray. God, my life is my lunch. I give these hands to you. I give this mind, these ears, these eyes, these feet, this voice, yours. I present them today to you. God, my life, my physical body, whatever you want today, Whenever and with whomever, your will, what you wish. I give my life, God, at your disposal. Present yourself to God first. And then, members, your body, present it to God as instruments for righteousness. rather than being spiritually lazy. God, today I present myself and I will be spiritually active in my spiritual disciplines. I will be spiritually alert and aware of sin's presence and the putridness of it. And I will hate it. And I will be aware of that large blue caterpillar wanting and seeking to step into the throne. I will be alert. I will be aware I will have my mind set on eternal things. I will acknowledge you in all of my ways. To be spiritually abiding. Two weeks ago, as we were in our Bible study and prayer time, we were looking at Abraham and his faith and looking at Hebrews 11 and that hall of faith and those that lived their lives by faith. They saw the promises of God and welcomed them from afar. That's, that's abiding. Persevering and continuing on. And I see the promises of God for eternity and we're not there yet, but I will welcome them from afar. And to be spiritually personal. And making it about Jesus Christ. And he says the motivation for all of this, in verse 14, he, he reemphasizes that truth and the reality that for sin will, no, will have no dominion over you. Why? Because you're not under law, but under grace. What does it mean to be under grace? Our immediate response is that, well, I have God's favor on my life. 
of his forgiveness. He's smiling at me because of his amazing grace. Absolutely. But what does he mean to be under grace? What has he just been establishing to us and with us in our own hearts and minds? To be under grace means to be united to Jesus. Chapter 5 and chapter 6 here. To be under grace means that in being united to Jesus, sin has been dethroned. And you are free from sin. And you now have this opportunity and ability and responsibility to present your life as an instrument to God for righteousness. You've been set free from sin's rule. That's what it means to be under grace. Paul would, is going to address here for us, we'll look at it a couple of weeks, and he's saying, well, oh, hey, to be under grace, can I just continue to sin? And of course the answer is absolutely not, because to be under grace means the exact opposite of that, it means you've been set free from sin. And so present your life to God as a tool for righteousness. And so what this means for us, a take-home truth is that my sin has been dethroned, but it still aims to rule me. My sin has been dethroned, but it still aims to rule. And our take-home truth, or excuse me, the task is that I must daily, in light of that truth, that I'm united with Christ and it's been dethroned, but it still is seeking that throne. Daily, I must present my life to God as an instrument of righteousness. And what this means for us as 24-7 worshipers, alongsiders, and as go people, is I bring us back to these. And just take a few minutes, maybe more, and just evaluate it. Am I spiritually lazy or active? Am I spiritually careless or am I spiritually alert? Am I spiritually inattentive to what is eternal or am I spiritually aware of them? Am I impatient or am I abiding? Am I impersonal or am I personal with my God, with Jesus Christ? And ask yourself, evaluate those things. In what ways can I... In what ways do I need to switch? In what ways am I using this body as an instrument to do what my sin is impassioned in me? In what way am I using my body as an instrument for righteousness? Daily present your life to God as an instrument. God, we love you because you first loved us. And the only way we can love you is because you've loved us and you have made us alive together with Christ, freeing us from sin's rule and mastery and dominion. And God, now please help us to do just this very thing that Paul is challenging us, to present our lives not as instruments of righteousness, but present our lives to you as an instrument for righteousness. God help us. In Jesus' name.